Des McEnough is the director of the revival of The Who's Tommy on Broadway. I'm David Buchanan with Gold Derby. Des, it's been almost or exactly 30 years since the original production um, in 1993, which you directed and co-wrote the book for. Why was this the perfect time to bring Tommy back to Broadway? 31 years ago, it would have been uh, in previews at the St. James Theater. And so here we are at the Nederlander more than three decades later. Um, you know, Pete Townsend, I suppose with my partnership and advice has been relatively stingy about giving the rights out over the last 30 years. I suppose we always imagined that a time would come when we could return to Tommy. Uh, a time would come when Tommy took on a particular kind of meaning and pertinence that inspired us to do it again. And that's really what happened. Um, I mean, I'm sure it's sound, we're in the commercial theater, so uh, uh, it, it always raises suspicions that one's doing it to make money. But the fact is, um, we're, I think we're doing it because we really love the piece and we want to introduce new people to it. Um, we were working on a screenplay. <clears throat> he called me a few years ago, Pete Townsend, and said it's time for us to make, you know, a movie of Tommy. And we worked on it. I did a screenplay with his, um, you know, uh, advice and, and uh, guidance. And, and I think during that process, we had this realization that the whole world is looking into a mirror and we sort of coined the first phrase, the world has finally caught up to Tommy Walker. Now it's a black mirror, but it's, you know, essentially what Tommy does. Tommy disappears into himself when he faces a violent and threatening world. And I think that's what an awful lot of people are doing right now. Also, I think maybe, more importantly, I think the generation that's coming along now, particularly Gen Z and your generation as well, there is a real spirit of rebellion. And that reminds us of the 60s. And the 60s actually went on basically into Watergate. So the 60s, we really mean the 60s and early 70s. I don't th think the 60s really started until the death of uh, JFK. And they went on for about a about 10 years after that. So, you know, I would have been, uh, you know, quite young in the early 70s. I would have been in my early 20s. But, you know, I remember that righteous anger <laughs> that I felt at the time and that my friends felt. And I see it in, in younger people today. So we thought that this would really strike a resonant chord. And uh, so far, we seem to be right. You know, we're we're selling a lot of tickets. It's a little bit astonishing the last few days. So hopefully that keeps up and we, we reach as many people as we possibly can. Yeah, I think it really does resonate with the present moment and, and with, with younger generations who didn't see the original. Um, in those 31 years, you've done so many incredible shows, either as a director or as a producer. Um, Jersey Boys um, is just one of many examples. Um, I wanted to ask you, were there any lessons learned in all of that kind of experience and all these different genres of musicals and other shows that when you came to revisit Tommy, you know, influenced maybe how you directed this revival versus the original? You know, I, I think I, I, I like to think I have a skill. And, you know, if I was making wheels, you know, I, I, I like to think I would be a, a, a decent wheelwright. And um, so... I think the more wheels you make, the better you get at making them. That's certainly true of, uh, in the theater. And so all experiences really do uh, deepen and improve your craft if you pay attention. Um, I think all kinds of things have changed. Uh, I think I was more of a terror uh, when I was younger and that probably, was, that probably came from fear uh, I think it often does when people, you know, are, are you know, really uh, wound up. Uh, so I think I've gotten past that, not because I'm cocky, just because, you know, you realize I don't believe in, in creation through crisis. Uh, people have to feel safe 
in, in a, a, a rehearsal room. And I think that's almost your primary job is to make people feel safe and, and free and, and to, they, they have to feel like they can make mistakes. So that's definitely changed. In terms of the craft itself, strangely enough, I think making films uh, got me to appreciate the importance of the partnership with actors. So I always knew about the partnership with, with, with Pete Townsend and the you know, various partnerships with my music staff and, and the designers that I get to work with and Lauren Lataro, our choreographer. So I've always um, had an understanding of, of taking the field with that particular team. But I think with actors, uh, you, you learn over the years that in a sense, they are the most important partners you have. You know, you have a couple of responsibilities and this is true in film as well. Um, in fact, I think I heard this from Scorsese at one point. You know, you have two big responsibilities, performance and telling a story. And so, um, you know, I think, I think that's, I hope my skills have been honed somewhat by doing so many projects. And this may surprise you, um, and it, I hope it doesn't sound pretentious, but, you know, I've actually directed a lot of plays by William Shakespeare and, and also Chekhov. And, and uh, I worked with the great Christopher Plummer, who was a wonderful partner. And I learned a lot, you know, from working with him. And it may seem unlikely, but you know, working with that language, uh, I think better equips me to work with, with, uh, with you know, with a, a musical like Tommy, not that there are other musicals like Tommy, but, you know, I, I work with the actors on treating the language like it's a rolling discovery, like it's a series of revelations. So that it's all about discovery. So you're watching somebody experience something. It's, it, you know, acting is experiential. I'm not sure I would have ever found that without verse drama. And some of the great, uh, you know, teachers I had there, the late Michael Langham and John Hirsch. And so the, when, the, when I think that the, even years ago, uh, when Pete and I first met, uh, um, you know, short anecdote, he arrived in San Diego. We had a couple of meetings in London and, and I think we were inclined to do the project together. I was certainly inclined. He was maybe still a little skeptical. And when he arrived in San Diego after this long flight, I said, well, you know, I've got this graduate class to teach at uh, the University of California, San Diego and uh, teaching graduate students. And it, you know, it's a class on Shakespeare, on text, on verse drama you know, why don't you rest at the hotel and I'll pick you up after. And he said, no, 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 no. He said, if you're doing a class, I'm here to, you know, get to know you and what you do. So I, I want to come. So this was a rather astonishing event for the, my graduate students that I walk into class with Pete Townsend and ask them if, you know, they minded having him sit in and they were delighted. And after that class, um, he said, you know, if you could do with my language, what you just did with that language, then we've got a deal. And, uh, and, and that may sound, again, it sounds pretentious and it might sound absurd, but it's really not. It's, it's, it's all the same thing, you know, uh, working with language on stage, whether you're doing Tommy or whether you're doing as you like it, it's essentially the same thing. And I think if you, approach it with hopefully with a certain amount of uh well curiosity for sure but even humility um with a certain amount of humility then uh it, it, it the language becomes your best friend and the actor's best friend yeah speaking of actors let's talk about ali lewis borsky who is just absolutely incredible in the title role um he was with the production um when you did the pre-broadway run um, and it's his Broadway debut. He has a lot of stage experience, but his first time on a Broadway stage. What makes Ali such a perfect Tommy, in your opinion? Youth. Um, when you're casting Tommy, ideally you want somebody that's in their early 20s, the, you know, basically the age of the character uh, that we, sometimes we call the, that character the narrator. 
uh, but he becomes Tommy over the course of the play. As you know, it starts with a, a four-year-old Tommy, then 10-year-old, and then finally uh, Ali's uh, steps into the part. And so youth is important, and it's, it's unusual to have somebody that's as old for his years as Ali. You know, he's, he's remarkably sharp and, and worldly for such a young man. Um, so often in the past, sometimes we actually ended up with somebody that's a little older who can play young, um, somebody who might be, you know, 30. Uh, but that has, was not the case with him. And he walked in and uh, I said to my colleagues, I said, he's really good looking, isn't he? Uh, now that's not, that's so cheap, I know, but it is, a, he is playing the lead in a musical and one wants him to be charismatic. But I don't want to take anything away from him. Uh, he, in terms of his acting ability, he has great chops. And his learning curve on this was practically vertical. I mean, if you'd come to the very first rehearsal and then you could transport yourself into the theater now, uh, you would be astonished at the, the, the growth and development. He does owe me a phone call right now, so I, I don't want to flatter him too much until he calls me back. But uh, he, he's, he remains totally unspoiled. And I'm a great believer in that sort of quality crossing the footlights. I think the audience knows uh, when someone uh, has integrity, and which he certainly does. So he has integrity, good looks, a great singing voice. He's a wonderful actor, and he can dance. That's it, you know. The whole package. Um, I, I want to ask you, too, about the other aspect of that story you were telling, which is, you know, for a director just to convey the story, work with actors and convey the story. Because this revival of Tommy has a kind of, uh, I'll use the term loosely, but like a frame device that you've added to the production where we're set kind of in the future. Um, I just wanted to ask you, what were the origins of that idea for this particular production? And in what way did that help you think about how to modernize the story? Whereas, you know, so much of it is still set within the period um, and resonates no matter when it's being staged. But what were the kind of ideas behind that frame device? You know, I in working on the screenplay uh, uh, with in conversation with some colleagues, it became clear that a framing device would uh, start the play more or less in the now, and that it would that would be a better threshold for going back, you know, to the origins of the story than just starting in World War II. But I must tell you what gave me confidence to do this, and Pete as well, of course, uh, had to do with the original album. Um, Kit Lampert, who was uh, one of Pete's managers and a kind of, I suppose, muse back in the days, and certainly an artistic advisor, you know, worked with Pete, and they had concocted a timeline that started in World War I, and yet, by this point, we were in 1969. So they time traveled quite rapidly. And when we started working on it in the early 90s, we decided to embrace World War II as a starting point. And there were many advantages in doing that. You know, the pinball machine, of course, is the electric guitar. And in our version, it goes from the electric guitar to the synthesizer to the computer and so on. But I, I've got to give credit to, to uh, the original creation. And, and that gave me uh, courage. I, I don't think we have, it's not a documentary. So I think it's, it's actually, I think, great to take the audience on a ride where we're disobedient when it comes to the passage of time. And I think it's impactful to uh, believe that Tommy's mystical journey takes him beyond the present. So I know that's a really convoluted answer, but that's really how it happened. Yeah, no, that's that's terrific. And there are so many individual moments, Des, that I could ask you about that I think are just so exciting and innovative and smart. Um, and we could talk about, of course, you know, Pinball Wizard, this iconic song and how you bring it to life in this production 
Um, I just want to ask you very specifically about the end of the show, though, and I want to give kind of a spoiler alert for folks who haven't gotten to the revival, you know, pause this interview and come back when you've seen it, because I think for all of the kind of incredible kind of set pieces, the projections are stellar, so much movement. You mentioned um, Lauren Lataro, who's just does some incredible work on this show. Here, um, here. I just think the final kind of moments of your production are so moving and simple, right? We have the whole ensemble kind of singing, you know, those reprises, you know, at the at the height of the stage. And then that beautiful kind of closing moment with the three Tommies standing together. Um, I don't know if that was in the original production, um, but if it was or if it wasn't, what is so moving to you about the end of the show and to close it on such a kind of intimate um, and just kind of beautiful and simple note like that. One of the things that's different in this production, uh, of course, we featured the three Tommies uh, before in a different way, different stage image. But, uh, you know, the thing about the, the, the um, ensemble advancing on the audience, uh, it was somewhat different before in that we, we, we put the uh, actors in the various characters' costumes. In this, you know, rendering of Tommy, the, the actors really are storytellers. So virtually all of them are in black. You know, there are times, we can talk about Pinball Wizard maybe a little bit too, but they appear with, with silver heads, almost like pinballs or, or certainly like the mirror image. They have black uh, as well. So when they can, they can, everything on stage is moved by the actors. So at the end, when there's this line of actors advances, it's it's almost like humanity, you know, uh, uh, coming toward the audience, and they're very emotional too. Uh, the other thing that I, I think in the in the there was a kind of an I don't want to say anti-family, but in this in the sixties, I think there was a, a great effort toward an international consciousness and the idea that you could create families beyond the one that you came from. Uh, but in theater, going back to the Greeks, we've always focused on the family, the house of Priam. You know, this is, this is what it's about. Those bloody and complex and, you know, Greek plays that involve incest and murder and power and, and the in, infanticide. And, um, they're actually all about a nuclear family or slightly extended family. It was all about families. And I think that was accepting that that's the real emotional core of this was important. I mean, at the end of the day, where you go, you go back to your family. And um, so I, I think that, sense that he finally resolves all of the angst that's built up uh, is important. And, you know, the other thing that I think is important about the ending is this is what I wish leaders and influencers would do, what Tommy does. He basically said, hey, you know, you don't have to follow me. You, you can't recreate my journey to reach your own kind of enlightenment. It's crazy. You know, I, I have nothing to give you. And he, and he finally comes to recognize that because of the violence that happens to Sally Simpson. So the ending is this cleansing. And I remember years ago, to give credit where credit's due, uh, there was a wonderful production that Joseph Papp did, and I got to work for uh, Mr. Papp for, for many years, and uh, he was a wonderful tutor as well, and passionate about Shakespeare, by the way. Um, he did a Richard Foreman did a production of, of Three Penny Opera with Raul Julia and a fantastic cast. And there was this image of this line of people walking very slowly toward the edge of the stage uh, with a wonderful actress, actor, uh, Roy Brock Smith, who I became friends with later, just turning a hurdy gurdy and singing Mac the Knife. And I, I, I quote that image. Obviously, we move a lot faster and it's an anthem as opposed to a, a solo. Um, but I remember just having the breath taken out of me just by that the sheer force of all those actors confronting the audience. So that was definitely uh, on my mind. And, and I think we all feel like we 
You want to celebrate the whole company because they are the storytellers. With all we do with, with light bars and Peter Negrini's spectacular projections and, and uh, David Korn's magnificent gunmetal uh, you know, shapes and recycling, uh, all, you know, the pinball machine is a table and a lit up door frame, which is every, so I love their imaginations, but ultimately it's about the actors. And I'm glad you mentioned Lauren Lotaro because she's my partner in all of the staging. And she's also uh, awfully good at, at the dance steps, which, so she's a great partner for me. Just to say something briefly about Pinball Wizard, either and I would go, that, that's the end of the first act. This was a huge discovery. When I first started working on the story with Pete, I, I, I couldn't find an act ending for act one. And I just thought maybe we just have to do it sung through. It's a little long for that. The first act's, you know, almost 60 minutes, 58 minutes. The second act's, you know, a little more than 45 minutes. I think that's a long time to ask people to sit there. I've tried to do that before and it's always a mistake. So, um, you know, I wanted to find an act ending. And then we found this fantastic thing, you know, eyesight to the blind, the, the reprise of, of uh, Sparks at the psychiatrist's office. And then, uh, or, or, I'm sorry, other way around, the, the reprise and then Sparks and then Acid Queen and Pinball Wizard. And it's like, you know, emotionally climbing Everest. But we did make some changes this time. I mean, first of all, Lauren's work is uh, just unbelievably strong with the dancers. But... I never, I didn't want to put electric guitars or anything like that in, in, in the show ever before. And I just had this, I hope, inspiration to find a way to quote the who. So we actually do meet the band, but they all have mirrored heads. So uh, the audience has to kind of figure out whether it's the who or not. The audience goes squirrely when they see that, by the way. And I, I think for the most part, it's probably the, the Who fans that do that. But I think it's just the sheer power of rock and roll and electric music. So somebody you know younger sees a, a rock band just tearing through it. And um, you know they just go crazy. And so I'm very proud of that, this production. And it's those mirrored heads that make that moment so strange. And if anybody that's watching, if you want to see The Who, if you don't know about The Who, which is fine, I mean, that was a long time ago, um, look up on YouTube, YouTube uh, uh, Who Are You? They do a recording, they're recording Who Are You? So they're in the studio and it is fantastic. So I wanted to inject that energy into our show and we found Pinball Wizard was the perfect vehicle for that. No question. It is an absolutely electric moment in the theater. I think everybody, like you said, is like jumping out of their seats. It's so kind of intoxicating. Um, Des McEnough, congratulations on this revival of The Who's Tommy. Thank you so much for talking to Gold Derby today. Oh, I enjoyed this tremendously. Uh, thank, thank you so much for your great questions. Mm -hmm.